Well, maybe I'll get started. It's 12.03. Great. So thank you everyone for joining us on this sunny Friday afternoon. Um, we're thrilled to have two experts with us to speak with you during this seminar. Um, my name is Erin Kaliba and I'll be the moderator for this afternoon. I'm in the medical school and I direct the data office for clinical and translational research, which is one of the medical school's office of research units. I also have the pleasure of being a member of the research data stewardship initiative working group, which is why I'm moderating today. So RDSI, um, if you're not familiar, um, was established a couple months before the January release of the NIH data sharing policy that we're all aware of. Um, but this group is, has, was pulled together to really help improve the rigor, the transparency, the impact of research and scholarship across all disciplines by providing resources and guidance, specifically around data management and data sharing. So if you haven't already, I really encourage you to go to the RDSI website, which Lindsay will put in the chat. And there's lots of great links there and other resources about the initiative. So we're so glad you, you could be with us for the second session of the winter seminar series in which we're hearing from a couple of U of M faculty who have expertise on both data management and data sharing. During our time today, I encourage you to ask questions in the chat box. There will also be about 10 minutes after each speaker in which you can raise your hand um, and we can have the discussion after each presentation that way. So I'm thrilled to introduce our first speaker today, Hernan Lopez Fernandez, who's an associate professor and curator of fishes in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology and the Museum of Zoology. Dr. Lopez Fernandez, his research uses fieldwork and natural history collections to study the evolution and ecology of complex biodiversity assemblages, focusing on freshwater fishes from South and Central America. In parallel with research in the evolutionary ecology, his lab also explores new uses for historical information about biodiversity that are held in, that are held in museums. So today, Dr. Lopez Fernandez will be presenting on harnessing non-traditional museum data for ecological and evolutionary research. I'm going to hand it over um, right now and have him start sharing. Welcome, Dr. Lopez Fernandez. Thank you, Matt. It's Aaron for that introduction and thanks everybody for coming. I suspect that my talk is going to be a little bit outside of the traditional talks of the RDSI, but that's uh, in a little bit by design because um, one thing I've discovered being part of the uh, of the RDSI meetings at, at, at several points is that the the data challenges that museums present are, are, are rather kind of unique. And I, I think it'll be interesting to, to uh, present some of these and, 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 and see uh, what folks think about the directions that, that can be taken with, with this data. Um, so at any rate, um, since you all work in uh, U of M, you're probably familiar with the Natural History Museum and the new Biological Sciences Building, or maybe you visited when it was at the old Ruthven Building. And um, in general, when we think of Natural History Museums, that is what we what comes to our minds is this uh, public look facing um, buildings that usually are kind of old or sort of vulnerable looking and that are dedicated to educating folks about natural history. It's a, ideally in a, in a sort of engaging and entertaining way. But what we know less is that most of those institutions in parallel have this thing that they tend to call the back of house or the research collections. In, in, in Michigan, we're no less than that. About five miles south of main campus, we have this uh, very large building called the Research Museum Center, which holds phenomenal natural history collections that are used for research on all manner of things. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what is it that we do, what our mission is, what sort of data we use. And uh, I'm going to close a little bit with some of the, of the challenges that they represent in terms of, of data management and sharing. Um, we have four natural history museums, the Anthropological Archaeology, the Herbarium, the Museum of Paleontology, and the Museum of Zoology. Um, and in general, 
it is valid to ask, why should we have research collections in a university like ours? And, re and what does this research look like in a natural history museum? So I'm just basically quoting from the self-study in, in my department, recently, which we have finished very recently. And uh, the premise is that in an era of unprecedented environmental change, biodiversity declines, and even zoonotic pandemics, natural history collections are an outsized but insufficiently used tool for all manner of fundamental, basic, and applied biodiversity research. And this is because natural history collections have some particularly interesting characteristics, mostly that through time, collections tend to become historical records of biodiversity that we can study in ways that the original collectors would have never dreamed of. Our collections go back well over 100 years, sometimes close to 200 years the university has been around. So we have a, a historical record of diversity that, that is truly, truly significant. But also in turn, part of our mission is to continue those collections so that the collections we make today become the substrate for future studies in ways that we don't know yet or can't imagine answering questions that in many cases we probably don't even know we're going to need to ask. So it's a transgenerational kind of enterprise and the type of, of research that we can do is limited basically by our imagination and by the tools that we can put into it. Um, the really important element about this that is also unique in terms of the data that we use and how we use it is that Museums do not work in isolation. We are actually part of, of a truly global network of natural history collections. Um, recently, we published this paper with another 150 something authors in, uh, in a study led by the Smithsonian, the Natural History Museum in London and the American Museum in which basically we started um, proposing a protocol that should allow us to eventually catalog an inventory of what material for biodiversity, anthropology, and paleontology is available worldwide. And just with the 73 museums that were part of this study, we were able to inventory more than 1.1 billion objects and specimens of all types of biodiversity from all over the world. And we all think, hope that this is going to be a first step towards creating a truly globally integrated data um, network that everybody can access regardless of where they are and what they're doing with it. And that's what the core mission of museums today is in this, in this world, especially driven by big data and data accessibility. So what do I mean by non-traditional data? And frankly, what is traditional data when we talk about uh, museums? So in general, when we tend to to think of museums, we think of the specimens or the objects that are stored in there. But what I mean by non-traditional data is that we can use physical, chemical, biological, geographical, and digital data that are associated with these traditional specimens to vastly complement and enhance the information content that we can uh, obtain from the specimens themselves. And that idea is the, of this multidimensional uh, museum data is the basis for what's been known as the extended specimen paradigm, which is an idea that for the last decade or so has been directly transforming how we think about museums and, and, and how we use them. And that has been driving a lot of the ways that we're thinking both about our physical collections and about the digital information associated with them here in Michigan and elsewhere. So before we get into a few examples of what we actually do, the extended specimen concept, I think, is worth visiting in a little bit of detail. So in a very traditional sense, you can look at this uh, not very good picture of a jar in the fish collection here at Michigan. This is one of more than 200,000 jars of fishes that we have in the museum that go back to, I think, 1835, maybe the first jar that we still have on uh, on record in the museum. And when we think of what we can do with that jar of fishes, the first thing that comes to mind, of course, is the fish. You know, there's there's fishes inside there. So working with the specimens that are inside the jar is evidently the first thing that comes to mind. It's very useful. We have used it for centuries now to catalog biodiversity, to name species and put them Latin names into our, into our formal classification systems and things like that. But we can use those things for a lot of other um, approaches to, to extracting data from the collections. One is to enhance that anatomical information through traditional methods like clearing and staining, which is what makes that fish red. 
or we can micro CT scan them and look at comparative anatomy and things like that. We can also use the specimens or the scans or versions or parts of the, of the specimens to do emergent analyses of that. For instance, we can calculate in the case of fishes how strongly a fish can bite or maybe how it's moving through the water column by taking measurements and applying biomechanical and functional morphological principles to the specimens. We can also take genetic data, and this is a, a fundamental way in which modern collections have changed. In addition to the specimens, we have tissue samples from which we can do genomic uh, sequencing, transcriptomic sequencing, or we can catalog the diversity of a site by using the collection as a reference and don't even have to fish. We can go take a water sample and sequence the DNA that's in the water and figure out what's living in there. We can use the molecular information to study things like, in this example, the spectral sensitivity of the proteins that are uh, capable of seeing color and different uh, wavelengths of light in the eye of a fish or some other of some other specimen. We can look at what a fish ate, or we can use stable isotopes in the tissue samples of, of that fish to understand how nutrients move through the food web and the ecosystem that that fish is part of. We can also look at the parasites and the diseases that are present in that fish. That wiggly thing on top of that fish is actually a leech. Turns out leeches that are specialized in feeding on fishes are not very well understood and very well known. So that's that adds another layer of information that uh, goes beyond the fish collection and helps us link different elements of biodiversity together. We can, of course, collect information of our, where the specimens come from. In this case, this is a picture of a very remote, pristine rainforest I've, I took in South America some years ago. So it gives us really invaluable information about where these specimens come from, where they, they live, and what they do, what do they need to live in. But also they serve us to track how places change. When we sample repeatedly in the same areas, we see how these places change and the place that might have looked like that 50 years ago here in Michigan today might be a movie theater or a parking lot or something like that. And that's important information. We can also link all of this with georeferencing and then add layers of geographic information systems on say things like land use or geology or forest composition and things like that and keep adding uh, additional dimensions of data to these extended specimens. So this is the angle from which we think about uh, information in the museums. I'm going to walk you haphazardly and randomly through a few things just to give you an example of the sort of data that we're, that we're creating and frankly in some cases struggling to figure out how to manage and, and share because there are new kinds of data. So this is, for example, uh, on the right is a little fish that we named back in 2018 with a few colleagues from Brazil down from the Amazon. Turns out this is a cichlid fish that we, that we study a lot in my lab. They have two sets of jaws, the jaws that we normally think of, which are in purple here in the scan, and a second set of jaws, the pharyngeal jaws in yellow, which are actually modifications of their pharynx that they stopped using those parts of the pharynx to breathe, and now they use them to manipulate prey. Without micro CT scanning, we never had the opportunity to look at those two sets of jaws in one single picture in 3D. So now we're, for the first time, being able to start trying to understand how those two sets of jaws may work together to, to capture and manipulate prey in ways that we couldn't have done before. But we also have to deal with the fact that each one of these CT scans is probably two to 20 gigabytes, and we need very powerful computers and imaging tools to handle them. Um, we're also exploring new ways to use CT scanning with soft tissues, for instance. I'm not going to get into crazy detail on this, but there are very interesting new possible avenues to do research just by the fact that we can digitize muscles and connective tissues and things like that and study them in ways that, that were not possible before. Um, one thing that I'm particularly fascinated by and, 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 and really excited about the promise of museums is, is the use of the historical data that goes with the specimens. So for instance, one thing we, we have been doing with a former graduate student of mine is basically pouring over a hundred years of records in, in museums here and in Canada and in South America to take qualitative handwritten notes from the field to try to extract information about the types of habitats where different fishes live. And along with that comes the creation of, of a methodology that allows people to do that with any kind of field data, be it for fishes or for birds or for something else. 
And then we can link those habitat information with all this functional information I was describing earlier and eventually understand, for example, what physical attributes of a fish allow them to be adapted or, to, or particularly able to swim in a, in, a, in a certain kind of habitat or whether a certain fish needs a particular kind of habitat in order to, to successfully thrive in a particular place. So clearly this has in, uh, value for evolutionary research like the one that I'm describing, but it also has intrinsically important ecological information that is also applicable for conservation that should allow us to understand how environmental change might be affecting um, biodiversity that lives in particular places. One example closer to home about this is this uh, this incredible effort called the Institute for Fisheries Research, which is a century old collaboration between our museums and the Department of Natural Resources in the state of Michigan. And they literally for a hundred years have been sampling in a very standard way, water bodies and fishes and taking notes on habitat structure and fisheries and fish development and things like that. And painstakingly putting them in these cards that are handwritten and typewritten and completely inaccessible in those metal cabinets where they have been kept for decades. So we created uh, a citizen science project based on, on the Zooniverse uh, platform online uh, with help from, from the Midas uh, grants and basically gathered a, an international network of 2,500 volunteers that transcribed over 70,000 cards of 100 years of environmental data about Michigan waterways. Turns out a lot of the fishes that were part of that study are in our collection. Some of them are cataloged, some of them are not, but we're trying to make a link between the specimens and this data that has been sitting in there because it opens an enormous op opportunity and variety of avenues to study the impacts of climate change in Michigan, for example, among many other things. And we're starting to produce some of the, of the output for this stuff in, in ways that are really interesting. First of all, like I was saying for the other study, we're creating a, a, a roadmap to do this with other collections that can be done in other states whose DNRs are, are collecting uh, environmental data for one type of biodiversity or another, but we can also start looking at actually what has been the impact of climate change on Michigan fishes in, in Michigan waters. And this is a, a manuscript that we have uh, in review in which we, just to make the case that this, this, this is important and it can be done, we have looked at largemouth bass, which is a really important uh, sports fishing species and seeing how their populations, distributions and densities have changed as climate has changed the temperature of waters across the state. And as you might imagine, where we see is that largemouth bass is moving northward, but it's, it's not just that they're expanding their distributions and they're changing their densities. They're becoming more dense in the north, less dense in the south, presumably because this much more warmer waters we have in the south may not be as, as uh, amenable for, for their success as, as they used to be. So we're starting to learn a lot of actual empirical information about how climate change has been affecting the state over the last hundred years. And we hope that that's gonna keep happening at a much larger scale. Um, so at any rate, like I said, this was gonna be a little bit uh, unusual of a talk, um, but we need to keep working on these collections and, and, and thinking about how we use their data in order to truly make us part of this global museum in a way that's, that's accessible to everybody. And to do that, we need to continue expanding the accessibility of this historical and contemporary data. And a lot of the challenges to do that are actually related to data science and informatics in ways that they didn't used to be uh, for museums until, until only a couple of decades ago. We also need to continue growing those collections to ensure that we keep having that record of biodiversity. We need to inform folks and expand the community of users of collections data because we're not all necessarily trained to use these kinds of magnitudes of data. And we also need to train the next generation of people who are going to take care of the collections and, and, and learn how to use them. And so if nothing else, if you're going to take anything home from this, please, let's go back to those two sentences and, and now I'll stop and I'll be happy to answer any questions if anybody has them. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. I'm gonna look, so you can again, um, type your questions into chat or you can raise your 
end, um, and we can have a discussion here. Maybe we're, Nick, can I uh, have you start? Sure. Um, so I, I, I think it's like, it's so mind boggling to think about how there's all these different layers of data through time that you start to layer on top of just a jar of fish or whatever, mm -hmm. whatever kind of sample you can think about. Um, and I know one thing that maybe we've talked about a little bit in the past, but you didn't mention today is the issue of um, like who owns the data and where the data sort of the provenance of the data yeah. from the beginning. So you collect, say, some fish from the Amazon rainforest. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm curious, like maybe you, maybe, maybe someone 200 years ago got permission from someone in the Brazilian government to do that or something like that. But now we have all these additional advanced techniques of things that we're extracting DNA, we're mm -hmm. doing isotopic analysis or whatever. And so like, how does, how is the community grappling around ownership of these new kinds of data that are sourced from um, collections that may have not even, like these ideas weren't even dreamed of back then. Right. As, yeah, I mean, in a nutshell, poorly, because uh, it's a very complicated uh, topic. I mean, like, like you very correctly pointed out, not just 200 years ago, but, but today, in order to do this kind of work in the field, you need all manner of permits at all sorts of levels. And you don't even have to go to, to the Amazon. I mean, to collect in Michigan, we need some very particular kinds of permits and we need to justify many of the things that we do in terms of why do you need to do this? And, and the truth is a lot of these things are legislated through global agreements on biodiversity and things like that, but a lot of these things are not. Um, and so for example, it's relatively straightforward to, to go to a place and, and, and get a permit for collecting and to put something in a museum, but it's less clear for example, what does a micro CT scan do? And some, some people would argue that because they are an exact facsimile, digital facsimile of a specimen, scans should be under the, under the regulations of the same uh, biodiversity laws that govern each country or, or that are globally um, accessible. Mm -hmm. But that is not formalized. Uh, they're, they're, it's unclear that any kind of formalization of those laws is, is gonna be easily enforceable. Um, and also there, there's, a, there's a sort of ongoing conversation about the, 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 the relatively intrinsic conflict of interests in, on the one hand, needing to understand where biodiversity is, how it is changing, and on the other hand, making that information accessible so that we can actually study it without uh, violating international uh, agreements without violating uh, specific countries' rights to their own biodiversity and deciding how to manage it is an extremely complicated topic that, to, to be perfectly honest with you, I, I'm not remotely, uh, you know, capable of discussing it in, in any formal way because I don't really have the training. It's, it's something that all of a sudden goes from fish biology to international law and you go, whoa. <laughs> You're right. So it's it's really one of the big challenges that I see down the road because these things are going to are going to become more and more frequent. It's already been happening in a very patchworky way with genetics and 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 what can and cannot be done and how it needs to be done when 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 museums and and, and folks that study uh, genetic uh, variation to genetic resources and things like that are, are involved in this stuff, sort of research, but there is no one way to do it. And, uh, and that makes things potentially very complicated. Yeah. And I think with a lot of data sharing, we, and, you know, Amy can probably speak to this. The technical is the easy part. It's the yes. regulatory, the sharing, the legal that are the challenges. Absolutely. Yeah. Alexa, let me uh, turn to you and have you ask a question. Thank you. This was really fascinating um, as, as you were talking and especially um, making your last point about expanding the community of users. I was just thinking a lot about the growth in environmental humanities and environmental history in particular mm -hmm. here. And so I just wondered a little if you've had 
um, interactions with the environmental historians group or if, if that's grown and if there are ideas um, about what kind of the two fields can offer each other, both in think like thinking about how, to your point about training people to interact with the various kinds of data that is not um, part of their uh, formal training, probably in their disciplines if they're coming from humanities, but also mm -hmm. what other fields might offer um, in terms of everything you're trying to capture and digitize and provide access to? That's a phenomenal question. And actually, I think it's, uh, again, I mean, embarrassingly, the short answer is no. I, we, we, at least myself, I'm, I'm not much in contact with environmental historians in the university. And I think this is something that is a, is a broad issue that we need to deal with. And my impression recurrently is, how is it that most folks at the University of Michigan don't even know that we have these collections? I mean, some of them are literally among the best on the planet for one thing or another. And I have yet to see one person that I bring for a tour here at the RMC, Nick is laughing. Um, uh, and and they don't get completely astonished by by the resources that we have. And this is true across the university. One of the things I love about Michigan is that it's constantly trying to build these bridges among otherwise, if not unlikely, at least um, unbeknown potential mm -hmm. partners. And uh, I think that's something that we need to do better at from the museum's perspective. And, and one of the reasons that I jumped at the opportunity of, of giving this talk is, is, is to make folks aware that this is happening and this is here because the success of the museum and, the, and of the collections depends on, on everybody who uses them. Um, it, it, I, I mean, yes, I collect fishes and I do research with the stuff that I collect and with the collection, but that's not the point of the collection. The collections are this, this platform for, for everybody to use. And, and we, frankly, I think, have not yet understood that, it, that we have tools now digitally and, and through the internet and through all this informatics um, capabilities that are relatively new, we have new tools to share the collections in, in ways that we, we just couldn't think. And, and that is why I ended up the presentation with that with that slide, because it is the it is truly the, the most deeply true thing of our collections is that we use them in ways that we never imagined we would. And that and that is exactly the kind of spirit we need to continue cultivating. So yes, we need we need to get more in touch with the environmental historians and the environmental historians with us and let's see what we can do. <laughs> and I I want to use those same volunteers that you got to uh, read through all those old handwritten things and, and put them into structured fields. I want to tap that resource again. <laughs> so let's, um, thanks so much for those questions. And I, I'd like to move on to our, our second presenter. So I'm just going to share this screen. Hopefully you can see our intro screen again. Um, so I'm thrilled to introduce our second presenter today, Amy Pienta. Dr. Pienta is a research professor of ICPSR at the Institute for Social Research at the University of Michigan. She directs the Business and Collection Development Unit at ICPSR. Her doctoral training is in sociology and she directs a number of projects developing research infrastructure that supports data sharing and reuse. These projects are funded by the National Institute on Drug Abuse, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, PCORI, and the Millennium Challenge Corporation Evidence Platform. Her recent research and writings examine data sharing and data reuse behaviors. So we'll be hearing from Dr. Pianta about data deposit services at ICPSR. Let me stop sharing and welcome Dr. Pianta. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, I was smiling so much through the last presentation, thinking about um, one of the challenges that's really presented itself to ICPSR, which is a domain repository for the social sciences, has been how we can collect our collection um, with pretty disparate uh, natural and physical science collections. And so we've been doing 
um, you know, uh, consulting with NASA, the Earth Science Center at Columbia. I'm attending a meeting uh, next week in Boulder um, of uh, a NOAA-sponsored meeting. And um, it feels to me like a really timely transition to think about um, how some of these really rich collections um, have come to be, but how they can also be used potentially together in the future. And so I, I was not meant to put our two presentations exactly together, but it's kind of nice to see them juxtaposed and, and showing the potential. Um, so I'm going to talk pretty um, briefly about uh, data deposit services at ICPSR. Um, in part because we, as a domain repository, have been collecting data for a long time. Uh, we serve a group much uh, broader than the University of Michigan. It's a domain repository that uh, reflects a worldwide membership in its um, uh, archive. Um, and in the US where we sort of uh, are, do not have a national data service, for sharing social and behavioral science data. Um, ICPSR has been um, for over 60 years an important uh, actor in uh, preserving and sharing social science data. And so um, I think that was an important sort of uh, intro. Um, it turns out though, <laughs> that one of the big uh, uh, or, uh, institutions that deposit data at ICPSR is the University of Michigan. Um, I think that's of course reflecting in part uh, the fact that we happen to be located at Michigan and not one of our other member institutions, um, but also reflects just the um, uh, strength and um, uh, importance of social science research at the University of Michigan. And so a lot of the really significant, large, important um, collections are ongoing at the University of Michigan from our large surveys to other innovative kinds of research projects. Um, so many of those end up making their way to ICPSR. Um, and this is meant to, um, this presentation is meant to just give a couple of high level sound bites about thinking about how ICPSR might be helpful um, to others who maybe are less familiar with us. Um, and uh, one of the first questions that we often get is, um, you couldn't possibly be interested in our data, are you? Um, and so uh, the collection development policy of ICPSR um, is a, um, a document, you can find it on our website that you can uh, peruse through. Uh, which shows uh, who are ICPSR users, and so what are the audiences of people that come looking for data, and so that can help you position whether your particular data collection might fit ICPSR. Um, it has details about data that are in scope for ICPSR, both disciplines that we've served historically, uh, the kinds of data generation techniques you'll find at ICPSR. I'm struggling right now to help a uh, very large uh, fMRI collection that we received recently at ICPSR get into the hands of the users just because it's uh, a bit different from some of our um, uh, more popular or data that we've received over the years in much larger numbers. So we have less brain data, but um, when we get brain data, we can usually support the dissemination of that as well. So the different kinds of data generation techniques are in this collection development policy. Um, as well as population groups that um, you might be studying that um, you might have questions about whether ICPSR would be interested. Those kinds of things are answered uh, in this policy. It also talks a little bit about data that are out of scope for ICPSR and the formats that we um, accept. Um, so many people know ICPSR for our large scale national surveys. Um, so yes, we have those in large numbers. Uh, but we also have um, much more mid-scale and small-scale studies as well. Um, it can be a one-time uh, study, or, you know, something that happened over the course of a year or a couple of years, won't be repeated again in the future, and you'll find many things like that at ICPSR. We have both qualitative and, and quantitative data collections, mixed method collections, and as I mentioned, a lot of other data types as well. Um, Maybe from hearing the um, projects that I work with, I work with um, my own particular portfolio of infrastructure at ICPSR um, is heavily embedded in um, health research. And so I can 
um, share more if people are interested in the kinds of clinical data that we have at ICPSR and other data from the health sciences. Um, administrative records uh, end up in ICPSR and as I said, brain images, sensor data and, and lots of things like that. We don't really have um, an exclusion on any particular data type, although there are things that are harder for ICPSR to be helpful with. Um, so the things that are out of scope. So would we take fish data? That's kind of an interesting question. We have some fish data, Hernan. Um, uh, probably not at all on the order and magnitude of what we would find in this amazing resource we just heard about. Um, but by and large, um, what we have are things that are important to the human condition and human well-being and human health, right? So things that um, so there will be physical science and natural science collections at ICPSR because those things touch on and being important to um, human health and well-being outcomes. Um, so um, just to keep that in mind, um, we generally uh, only uh, accept data where we don't have to purchase it. So ICPSR is not licensing and purchasing data. Um, if uh, the data have to be limited in access to a particular group, not, not restricted because there's human confidentiality issues that we handle, uh, but rather um, something that would have to be limited to a certain set of uh, researchers we would um, accept. Um, sometimes copyright issues prevent us from helping with data um, and availability elsewhere. And so um, while it doesn't mean that if a version is available from another archive, we would outright say no, but it's clear that um, if that is the case, we have to think about what is the value added of putting the data at ICPSR. And in this um, ever evolving interconnected set of uh, repositories that are out there, um, the hope would be that we could um, uh, link to collections elsewhere to help those data be more findable and use ICPSR like that more and more in the future. Um, so. Um, You'll hear uh, about ICPSR perhaps if you're not familiar already uh, because somebody else might tell you about it, but we're also always um, out there at conferences and workshops, both at, um, at professional meetings, but also lots of things on campus uh, talking about our services. Um, so look for us there. Uh, we have an active social a set of social media uh, handles to follow that help um, People learn more about our deposit services uh, and other things as well. Um, I wanted to recognize um, thinking about uh, sharing data that it's not always uh, easy to share data and people have important concerns about sharing data that um, we work on at ICPSR. Um, so some of the things that uh, we hear about um, from researchers who we might proactively reach out and ask for data uh, is that they don't have time uh, to prepare their data for uh, archiving at ICPSR. And of course, many of these policy mandates um, that are in journal mandates that are coming are, are changing this, like people are, are thinking about data sharing much earlier on in the data life cycle. Um, but for those that haven't planned to share their data, um, some of these uh, resource issues can be pretty important. Um, we obviously do a lot of consultation and support to help people work through some of those issues. Um, we are, are uh, an organization that um, will help because we are offering curation of, of um, data um, such that our uh, professional staff um, have tools and workflows to improve uh, the data sets that are given to us. And so researchers only have to get them to a certain uh, level and then we can do the rest. Um, and then soon um, with uh, initiatives we have ongoing, we are building additional tools to help support uh, researchers who are looking to better document and, and share their data. Uh, Turbo Curator is one of those products that is coming um, versions of it, the early parts that are coming in the next year at ICPSR, and that is um, funded by the National Science Foundation, which is allowing us to build these um, even better tools to help researchers prepare their data for ICPSR. Um, 
a lot of people are concerned about confidentiality and sensitivity of their data. Um, there are reasons that data cannot be shared and often it you know, goes back to the informed consent. Um, but where the informed consent allows for a sharing of uh, data at all, um, we generally can protect um, many of the uh, uh, disclosure risks that are inherent in human data uh, through the different restricted data services and capabilities that we have at ICPSR. Um, embargoes are possible uh, for people who are worried about not having enough time to do their work. Although again, with the NIH data sharing policy, that's a little bit different um, in terms of very clear expectations on when data should be available um, and not embargoed. Um, and then others talk about the lack of rewards for sharing, which of course is another rapidly changing space. Um, so I want to jump here. Um, so assuming that you've deposited data at uh, ICPSR, uh, this is the expectations. Um, most of the data sets will be curated. We do have some open uncurated areas of ICPSR where people can just self-publish their data called open ICPSR. But assuming the data are um, um, going to one of our curated archives, uh, curation staff get the data, they review the data, disclosure risks. Um, there's sometimes a back and forth with the investigators who've deposited data with us. Um, as I mentioned, a disclosure risk review and more in intensive curation steps to check the quality of the data, the thoroughness of the uh, documentation, those kinds of things. Um, and then um, all of the data sets um, in a package um, where we can, we will make um, additional formats available for easier use by the uh, data reusers who are going to come to our site looking for those data, um, and of course, POIs. Um, so this is what it looks like, up, a study up on a, on a homepage, a very robust homepage with lots of information about the methodology of the study, places to download the data, explore the variables, related publications, all of those things that we proactively uh, track for many of our collections. Um, and then on the um, uh, uh, side panel there, you can see the um, the amount of um, downloads to the data. So I'm looking at that pretty quickly because I just want to show a couple of places on our website and why I didn't screen share. Hopefully you can see this. This is the ICPSR collection development policy. So as I mentioned, a good place for users, what are the formats we accept, those kinds of things. So um, you type in collection development policy in the search bar and you'll go there pretty quickly. Um, if you're an NIH investigator or you are talking to NIH investigators, uh, we have a resource page up for uh, NIH investigators looking to meet the new data management and sharing policy. Um, I will call your attention uh, here to um, this template. This is uh, brand new, I think, um, in the last week we put this up weeks ago, maybe, um, we actually have um, uh, recommended responses and ranges of responses for people looking to designate ICPSR as the repository in their NIH data management and sharing plan. Um, so that's a great template. I'm not going to click it, just download the file. Um, we don't have a, a, a web interface yet for the actual text yet, but we at least have this file up that people can download and look at the template. Um, we have a really a newer and a really helpful resource for um, people with qualitative data, both what it is, how you would prepare your data, uh, the kinds of capabilities that ICPSR has around qualitative data. Um, and you can get there as well by typing in um, qualitative data. You'll find it as a top hit on our website. Um, so with that, I am going to um, stop sharing and see if there were any questions about. Yeah. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. And uh, it's amazing to learn about, you know, a unit in our own institution, which I, you know, just down the hall, which I wish I knew more. This, forgive me if this is a naive question. Is sharing with ICPSR, does that meet the requirement of sharing data post study? Are, is like ICPSR a recognized NIH 
repository? Yeah, it is. So it's one of the designated repositories. Um, we have several NIH sponsored repositories as well. Um, there will be a little bit of a different user experience. If something goes to one of those NIH repositories, they will be free for all users. Otherwise, um, uh, member institutions get access to ICPSR data and others pay a fee. Um, but that doesn't, that's just supported data sharing, right? Curation is expensive and NIH considers ICPSR's curation value um, to be a recognized um, uh, addition. And, and so there's, I don't think it's in conflict with the data management and sharing policy from all the leadership discussions that I've had at NIH. Okay, no problem. <laughs> yeah, we do have a new cost model available for those who care that their data are open and not member and they can't fit into one of the NIH um, projects that we have. Um, they can just write um, uh, a budget into uh, write ICPSR services into their NIH budget. Um, and for a standard submission, uh, we have a set dollar amount for that. And for complex things, we help people figure out what that cost would be. Um, but that will soon appear on the NIH page that I shared. Something needs to pay for that cool tool called Turbo Curator, I'm sure. That sounds awesome. <laughs> Nick, let me turn to you for a question. Uh, I was also just going to add, I think we, we should make sure um, we sort of um, promote that last thing that you, you mentioned, Amy. Like, uh, I think. Mm -hmm. The budgeting around these policies is is tricky, and I think everyone's trying to sort of grapple with that as they are writing their proposals um, to NIH or elsewhere. And um, yeah, a lot of times it's like I don't know how much to to say it's going to cost, and some journals are tacking it on to what the the publishing costs associated with the journal, and so it's yeah, it's it's still messy. So it's nice having a concrete thing to say we're going to budget this much for for these data. Um, I, be a free option at ICPSR because we both right now have open ICPSR where people can self-publish. Um, and uh, the, the transition inflection point for ICPSR in the future will be to consolidate open ICPSR and are curated into a single stream so that people can make the decision to get a DOI and publish a version of their data and then offer to ICPSR to curate other versions for its audiences or one of these paid you know, sponsors that have an archive there. Um, so free is always <laughs> an option <laughs> at ICPSR that I think is like one of the things that people forget. They think it's free. Yeah, yeah, great. Uh, I, my original question was going to be more, since this is a, a U of M audience and most of the folks that watch online after this um, are going to be from U of M, are there things that are specific to U of M at ICPSR? Because we have many sort of, I guess there's nothing quite like ICPSR at Michigan, but there are lots of things like that that are, you know, multi-university consortia that live at the university or within the university. And it's, it's always like unclear to me exactly what the institution's role is or what, if anything, the institution sort of um, uh, has in terms of access to things that as the host institution. So is there is there anything like that 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 our researchers should know about for that are specific to U of M? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, at U of M, um, historically, we have, you know, had an easier time ex accepting collections that have um, uh, disclosure risks included without needing to execute um, some kind of uh, uh, institutional data use agreement that allows Michigan to do its work, right? So Michigan is itself <laughs> accepting its own data. Um, and so that has made the transition of um, restricted data sets to ICPSR a lot easier. Um, I think going forward, our plan, we have a, a data privacy officer who has uh, suggested that while we can consult the IRB HUM and other things at the University of Michigan, um, that we'd want to spell those things out in just a simple memorandum of understanding. And so again, it, should, it will still be easier than um, trying to um, deposit data from the outside into ICPSR, but we're going to add a little bit more structure to those um, uh, deposits uh, just to make it easy for, easier for us to um, meet the obligations of the University of Michigan. 
I mean, that's, I feel like that's really good to know because anything that might sort of lower barriers to entry and sometimes going through DUAs um, can be, can be hard and complicated. Um, so that, that's really, that's really, really helpful to know. Yeah, no DUA. <laughs> and using data too is easier for, for Michigan users. It's a slightly different uh, DUA if you're trying to access one of our restricted collections. Thank you. Amy, in terms of data standardization, it sounds like for you know people looking to deposit data, there are there are metadata fields that you ask that they complete so that a secondary user of those data can understand how they were collected, who was approached, things like that, and put into context the data before they use it. How hard is it to be, you know, consistent across all the different types, you get survey data, you get, you know, measurement data, how hard is it to ask for metadata when it might vary so much, you know, set to set? Yeah, that's a great question, Erin. The, um, I think in, in um, most recent history, it's actually been getting a little bit harder. Our metadata do a good job of describing lots of different methods. Um, but I think in the example that I just shared, fMRIs, EEGs, you know, brain data, um, obviously, you know, places like Open Neuro have very um, uh, uh, distinct metadata fields that ICPSR is not collecting. So we can just describe the study at a high level like we do all studies. Um, we accept the bids format, which is the brain imaging um, agreed upon format for how things should be structured. Um, so we can retain all of that um, pre-processed or pre-organized uh, collections when we get them. Um, but there's still this um, uh, other set of information, you know, what equipment was it on, what frequency, you know, all those different kinds of questions that we're not presenting easily and upfront to the user. Um, and so part of the um, uh, research infrastructure uh, development efforts going on at ICPSR is to stand up templates for some of these new data types mm -hmm. that allow for um, data type specific metadata uh, to be shared so that we can improve on that as well. That would be great. Yeah, that's really I want to, before we conclude, um, Alexa, I'd love to give you a chance to ask a question. Thanks. So the, um, thank you for the for the presentation. And when you made the point at the beginning about um, there not being like a national repository, it was just making me think a little bit about this very new initiative that's not really a national repository, but the US repository network that I know like a teeny tiny little bit about. And it's been not really clear to me if they're focused um, more on publications or publications and data or anything and everything. But it so so that's one thing. But I was also just thinking about in the time that ICPSR has been operating, obviously a change is that there's been more of a proliferation of other kinds of repositories and more of a network, whether formal or informal. So I just wondered how that impacts your service model or the way you engage with potential depositors and um if that's been beneficial complicating or what that has has been like just in terms of your operations i mean i think it's beneficial to the social sciences at large when with all of the um increasing options where people have to um uh share their data um again i think that the real the interoperability piece is the direction that um, we'll end up making so many more strides in the next decade or two um, that hopefully it begins to feel like you can get data from anywhere. And I don't know, ICPSR feels, I think, is still pretty uh, unique niche in the social sciences because of its curation model and its ability to handle restricted data. There's so we haven't, we haven't, we've only gotten more business, I guess, or more data and more, more projects. We haven't gotten less. Um, because even around with all these other options that are available. And again, these policies, of course, just mean that there's so much data that needs to be serviced that um, we welcome um, our collaborators in that space. So this good job security, Amy, for you. <laughs> well, listen, I wanna um, specifically thank 
Dr. Lopez Fernandez, Dr. Pienta, and you all for uh, spending time with us this afternoon for the great questions. And um, please continue the dialogue and continue to, to reach out and help move us forward on this topic. Thanks everyone, have a good weekend.